humans of planet Earth, many of you are suffering from a sickness and you don't even know it. Many of you think that The Dark Knight is better than Batman Begins and we here at The Real World have the cure and it's called Episode 5 of The Cape Crusade, of the Tape Crusaders. Got the name wrong, ruined the whole smooth intro. Uh, and I used to suffer from this disease and one man told me and I didn't believe him and that one man was Mike Thomas. You were enlightened. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, I'm concerned in a time of crisis and confusion in a society. People have turned to something they don't quite understand to make easy choices for them and uh, have elected a fascist to, to take control of the land. But enough about Batman Begins. Let's talk some politics. Yeah, yo. Yeah, we legitimately... Uh... Oh, okay, you, you slow clapping yourself. Oh, no, I'm, I'm literally slapping my thigh. Oh, and, uh... Okay. Oh, yeah, right. It wasn't just a knee slapping laugh, it was a thigh slapping laugh. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, um, we literally took some time off to react to real world politic events, but we're right. back now to talk about men in superhero costumes punching people. So, rest at ease. I, it's not so much that I'm like, Batman Begins is 100% better than The Dark Knight, it's more just that The Dark Knight gets all the hype and Batman Begins is after nothing else right up there. And yes. it's like it's like a one A one B situation for me. Yes, uh, it's like when people say, "What's your favorite HBO show?" It's like, well, it's probably The Wire, but you know, The Sopranos is it's there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I um, I had I've seen The Dark Knight a lot, um, as, as, have as have many people, uh, and I've seen Dark Knight. A fairly popular film in its day. Yeah, I've seen Dark Knight Rises quite a bit. I haven't actually seen Batman Begins for several years before doing this podcast and i don't know if it's just because i'm fresh off it but my takeaway from it was man this is the best batman movie they ever did make it's certainly possible um it is delightful it makes me feel warm on the inside i don't know if i love every moment of it but it's it's a pretty special movie where i think people have this idea that superhero movies either need to have no 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 nuance in their portrayals of the main characters, like in the majority of the Marvel films, or darkness, 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 like with the current DC direction, yeah. it is nice just to have a film that is both fun and interesting. <laughs> that, that is incredibly true. And if we travel back in time to the year 2005, not all superhero films were ripping this off because this didn't exist yet. So, you know, if you say to me now, oh, they're going to do this this dark reboot, this origin story, blah, 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 I'm sick of hearing it. Back then, they get a free pass, because they were kind of the first people to do it, and now every franchise has rebooted, gone darker, focused on the origin, and we'll get into that as we go. We've talked about it before, but even just the concept that these movies are dark, I'm, I'm nearly convinced yeah. it's just because two of the movies have the word dark in it. Like, I... <laughs> They're not even visually all that dark. Yeah, They're, especially this one. Yeah, uh, and, and even in The Dark Knight, you see Batman in the daylight probably more often than any other film. Uh, yeah. Or at least, in like, if not the daylight, with like, it's not dark. Like, it's literally just not dark all the time. Yeah, well, uh, Dark Knight Rises, the climax is in the middle of, in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> which, like, even, and even that, like, gave it a really unique yeah. look and uh, feel. Um I don't think of these movies as dark in any way. I think they just are movies that take the material seriously, mm. but not so seriously that you can't have fun with it. Yeah, I was I was going to kind of save this point for later, but I think a key misconception uh, with these this trilogy of films, the Christopher Nolan Batmans, is that they are good because they're dark, or they're dark yeah. and that makes them good. And that's not true. They're good, and they also happen to... Well, you, you said they're not even that dark... You can see why people would think they were, but I, I agree with you. They're not actually as dark as people give it. it. It just feels like such a sort of snap takeaway. Like, they've grabbed one as aspect of this trilogy and run with it, and they've forgotten everything happening around that aspect. And they've all just gone off to do their dark reboots, and they've forgotten to actually make a good film while they're at it. Yeah. And uh, if nothing else, this is a, this is a good movie. Mm. This is a really, really good movie. Very, very solid film. So, as I said, we are traveling back to 2005, 
and you know there hasn't been a Batman film in quite a few years eight, because of eight years. Yes, because of the uh, well, we discussed it last time what Joel Schumacher did to the Batman franchise. Um, so there were plans all along to do a fifth film, uh, which went by names such as Batman Unchained and others. There was also plans for a Robin film. Both got cancelled because of the fallout of Batman and Robin. Uh, they went through a long period of trying to come up with ways to move forward. They considered Batman Beyond, which is about, you know, Gotham in the future with a different dude taking on the mantle of Batman, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a film called Dark Knight with... It's a different Dark Knight, and it's an older Bruce dealing with the Man Bat, and even a version of Batman vs Superman were all considered. Then uh, the studio were very intent on doing Year One, which uh, Joel Schumacher actually did adamantly want to do, but they took it away from him, thankfully. Uh, and Darren Aronofsky of all people was uh, attached, and they brought in Frank Miller, who wrote Year One to write the script and they came up with just the craziest thing you'll ever hear in your life with Alfred being an African American man called Big Al who's a car mechanic and a homeless Bruce Wayne and just all these crazy changes and Warner Bros were like maybe not and that's when we get one Christopher Nolan and David Goya coming aboard and uh, they would create the version of the film that we know. The principal thing to look at here is, I mean, I know Tim Burton is a respected filmmaker, but Christopher Nolan is, without doubt, the best filmmaker to touch a superhero film, in my mind. Um, in terms of, like, he makes serious yes. projects, he makes grown-up projects, as it were. Not that that's necessarily... Not that there's anything wrong with not making something serious and grown-up. It's just, this is a very different style of filmmaker. Yeah, I'm actually now you say that. I'm trying to. I mean, like Richard Donner seems pre, like okay. to know what he's doing. Okay, fine, sure. But uh, no, but I'm not like modern, saying that. Of the modern era where superhero yeah. films are everywhere. I, and I'm not saying that like Donner's better one way or the other. I don't know Donner's filmography well enough to judge. I'm just saying. I I wonder. I, I it's a question I've never considered before. So I'm now kind of well, just going off the top of my head, including Nolan himself, uh, Revere that uh, that first Superman film. Regardless of how it holds up now, uh, it's it's sort of well regarded in the industry. But just he's approaching this from a different angle than anyone had in a long time. Let's put it that way. And just yeah, I mean you you know Nolan, you know what he makes, and he does that here, and it works. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually it's kind of interesting um, to track Nolan's. Uh, progress as a filmmaker or arguably his regression as a filmmaker mm. throughout the trilogy and mm. to see the films he makes in between the movies and then immediately after is uh, I think incredibly interesting Are you saying that Inception distracted him from Batman? No, no, I, I, I think <laughs> it's uh, I, I, if anything I admire his commitment to, to just to focus on something else I think it's probably healthy as an artist to do such a thing like that Yes. Uh, so, yeah, Nolan directed it. He co-wrote it with David Goya, who, you know, he wrote Blade, he wrote Dark City, which I think is a very underrated film. Uh, but then he also wrote Jumper and Ghost Rider and Batman vs. Superman. So a very mixed bag, but he is giving us his best work here, I think, uh, with this trilogy, or two-thirds of it. The two of them together sat down, and I think, like I was talking about a, a serious filmmaker, I think that really shows in this film that there seems to be a lot more sort of forward planning and attention to detail, and it seems very carefully and properly laid out. Like they really thought everything through, um, the way it all, both within this film and as a trilogy, how one thing leads to another, and it all is logical and sensible and. Yeah, I, I think in particular in the way that they make the, each film feel like a complete story. Yes. Uh, in that, I mean, like the things you would maybe claim are things laying the ground for future things could have just easily been ignored in the future due to them not being really prominent here. Yeah. Um, it's more, it, it felt truly or like an organic piggybacking off of things in this movie to in retrospect, almost seem like they were on purpose, but like you wouldn't know for yeah. sure one way or the other. 
Yeah, and like this film does, of course, end with the enormous tease of the Joker. But generally speaking, these God, films... that, were you in the theater for that? No, this oh, fi- this so film had already come so out exciting. before I even knew it existed. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, when that moment happened, like it's it's yeah. one of the hypest moments ever I've ever had in a movie theater. Because <laughs> you just like sat through this really really fun movie, and then you get that at the end. Yeah. And um, yeah, and as, it's especially for as a kid. Like I mean, I guess I was sixteen, so I wasn't too much of a kid. But it was the advertising for Batman Begins was a little underwhelming because there wasn't any of the classic villains which I had come to associate with Batman. Yeah. And come to it. Um, to anticipate existing in any Batman movie, like I'm used to two villains by this time, and now I've never really heard of any of them besides the Scarecrow. And the Scarecrow <laughs> wasn't uh, that. They've big done, of a they've done deal. some work to rehabilitate Scarecrow, but he was really not considered an A-list hero at the time. Um, yeah, uh, and like like I said, that this film had come out before I even knew it existed. Obviously, you know, 2005, we're both younger maybe there is less general awareness of film, but I feel this kind of came out, was quietly really good, did decent enough, and then when Dark Knight rolls around in a few years, biggest hype train of all time, Batman's here, and it's because of this film, but sort of retrospectively almost. Yeah, like the Dark Knight was a phenomenon. Yeah, Batman Begins... I remember seeing a trailer with no sound while waiting to see another film. Like in the lobby, they had screens with no sound. And I just I remember seeing the Dark Knight trailer and thinking, "Oh my god!" But yeah, this just kind of appeared in in my personal sort of world. It just it just popped up. I didn't know it was coming, and I was very surprised. It was you know I was starting to hear people say, "Oh man, this Batman film is like really good." Not just like as a superhero film, but just as a film. I was like, "Really?" And they were right. It is a very good film. Yeah. Um, so I guess we should get into that. Yes, we should. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down. Uh, so this is very loosely bo- borrowing some elements of uh, of Year One, but it's taking some tone from the Long Halloween and stuff like that. So uh, Bruce Wayne spends several years traveling the globe after his parents are killed, and he ends up in a prison in Bhutan where he's approached shortly before his release by Henry Ducard, uh, who takes him to the League of Shadows, led by Raish al Ghul. Uh, pronounced Ra- Raz al Ghul in the films, but I am king of nerds, so I will be using the authentic Raish al Ghul while Mike wants to punch me. He gets trained by the League of Shadows, but then he doesn't want to kill someone in his final exam, and he rejects the idea that Gotham is beyond saving. So uh, he fights his way out, and he... Uh, barely saves Ducard's life while everyone else seemingly dies. Uh, and then he returns to Gotham, becomes reacquainted with childhood friend Rachel Dawes, and he makes himself known to the board of Wayne Enterprises. Uh, and he's he's sick of Gotham being so corrupt and rampant with organised crime. Uh, so he creates this Batman persona using the League of Shadows training, but also his sort of moral grounding from his father. Uh, and he begins taking the law into his own hands, and... He is an enemy of the mob and Gotham police, except for Jim Gordon, who is the city's only honest cop, it would seem. Uh, meanwhile, you've got Jonathan Crane, a.k.a. the Scarecrow, who is working with the mob to bring uh, drugs into the city, as well as uh, the ingredients for his fear toxin. Uh, and he is secretly dumping this toxin into the water supply uh, on orders from the League of Shadows, hoping to release it later using a magical machine. Uh, Bruce is confronted in his home by Ducard, who is uh, back, and he (laughs) is revealed to be the real Ra's al Ghul in a wonderful scene. Uh, And he burns Wayne Manor. He is Ra's al Ghul immortal. (laughs) His methods supernatural. Very authentic Liam Neeson voice there. Um, <laughs> when man is burned down, Alfred saves Bruce. Scarecrow's toxin is released into large parts of the city, and there's a huge breakout from Arkham Asylum. So you've got crazy criminals running around, people hallucinating, uh, and the cops can't really do much to help. So Batman, with the help of Lucius Fox, uh, creates an antidote. Uh, Rachel actually defeats Scarecrow with a taser and makes him look like a big old candy ass. Uh, Batman fights Raish, and while he won't kill him, he doesn't have to save him, and uh, he lets him die in a train crash. 
and our film ends with Rachel telling Bruce that she can't be with him because the man she loved never came back to Gotham, but maybe he's still in there somewhere. And uh, then, far more importantly, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, Batman meets Jim Gordon on the rooftop, where he is given a Joker playing card from one of the escaped Arkham patients. That that that's the impl- okay. So I was actually just thinking about that today, whether that's the implication, because how much time passed between Batman being on the roof and the playing card? I mean, and, and uh, excuse me, Batman being on the roof and the the whole situation on uh, the island, whatever it was. Uh, it it's ambiguous. One would assume a few days afterwards, because they're talking about how there are still some criminals out there from the breakout, and that they will get them all. And then Gordon says, speaking of which, here's this playing card. I, I, like, I don't doubt that's possible. I don't think you can speak of that as being the absolute truth, that he absolutely came from that. Uh, it's, it's, he's brought up not directly after that. It's brought up in the context of escalation. Yes. I mean, yeah, the, yeah. That, like the, the film ends with Gordon giving this speech about how you know we get body armor, so I, they get armor-piercing yeah. rounds. And the ver- you know it's a it's is a it? key tenant of Batman. While he's doing good, he's also inviting a higher class of criminal like the Joker. Like, and that's that's what this film is about. Like, he starts off fighting the mob, which only he can do something about because the police are corrupt, and that's a very normal. You know, it's just guys with guns, and then you graduate up to the supervillains. We're getting like, very I, bogged I, down I, in a very minor. We're detail. getting off. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we don't need to be discussing this, but I. I think discussing that as an saying that as an absolute. Okay, I I interpret is, it as he was one of the many people that broke out. That is not necessarily the case. Anyway, I guess as always we've got. To, I mean, you know, new new franchise. We've lost all of our beloved previous characters. We've got a whole new cast. I, do you want to dive into them, or do you want to just talk about the film? Or? Um, I I feel I guess we have to start with Christian Bale, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, Chris Jenba. The Welsh Nightmare. This is arguably the best we will ever see Batman on uh, the big screen. Uh, at least, I mean, I don't. Th- I mean, I don't think anything before this came close. And while Affleck is was fine so far, I don't think he's anywhere really near this. Yeah, that's the thing about Affleck. It's like no one's saying, "Oh, he's really good." It's just more he's. Yeah, he's fine. He's not bad. He's, he's the best part in a really bad movie. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, that's not high praise. Uh, yeah, I think if Bale does just this film, he is the undisputed best Batman. And he's still like way up there, even with... Uh, I, I think his work... Maybe not his work, but the character uh, goes downhill throughout the trilogy. But so strong in this film. The most three-dimensional Bruce Wayne and a decent Batman as well. I've always felt like people, I think because the filmmaking in these films is so high that they are judging Bale's work and his portrayal of Bruce and Batman and also the public portrayal of Bruce on a completely different level. It's like, I don't think anything before comes anywhere close to anything Bale does in these movies. I'm not even really sure what you would point to in these other movies and be like, well, Bale's not as good as that. <laughs> um yeah, I just I don't see it at all. I, I, I don't think it's even really close. Uh, the only thing I don't think Bale's great at is playing the public Bruce Wayne. Yeah. But the fact that the public Bruce Wayne comes off like a phony shithead is kind of the point. <laughs> at least, the, and I and I think I think it's effective in coming off like a phony shithead. Uh, I just I think some of it may be that Bale is just perceived in a different way generally as an actor than some of the other people that have played Bruce Wayne, like, you don't think of him as this sort of sex symbol A-list celebrity like, he's a very serious actor, he's had yeah. his, you know issues, um I don't know, like, there's there's an element there that you don't quite buy him as, like, the most handsome, richest playboy in the city, like, he's in no way bad I think he does it really well, in this film particularly um, but there is just there is some intangible quality to him that doesn't quite ring true in the way that it did with Keaton and Clooney. For as like bad as he was, you'd still be like, "Well, I could see that as Bruce Wayne," you know. Yeah, uh, but again, I don't want to take like, away. I, mean, I, I I'm just trying to 
suggest a reason why people might detract from it. I think his work here is perfect. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, as we talked about, I can't get on board with saying too many positive things about Michael Keaton's work. Michael Keaton's work as Batman, even if I don't think it's his fault so much as I, I, I think almost Keaton is elevated by the fact that in terms of perception based on what's surrounding him and Bale is probably held to way too high of a standard mm. based on how good everything else is around him. Yeah. Well, he's just, but, he's uh, a more serious man. Like you, I think it's just, I think that is the thing. I think Keaton has a kind of cool mystique to him that people, people like, like him inherently more than Bale, even if Bale is like objectively giving a better performance. I think that yeah. is where a lot of the sort of, almost cult worship of, of Keaton's Batman comes from. It's just like, ah, well, I like Michael Keaton, he's cool, blah. It's so bizarre to me. It's I certainly, think. there is no way that he is acting as well as Bale does here. Uh, um, um, I like that yeah. one of the things he said that uh, attracted him to this project, like, he, he read a Batman comic called Arkham Asylum uh, years before this film was even close to existing, and he had this thought that, like, in none of these previous Batman films have they properly kind of conveyed aspects of this character that are very interesting and that he felt that... I, I think he's 100% right, and I think it's ironic because it ends up happening with this franchise as well, that they were such a heavy focus on the villains at the expense of Batman being interesting, and he was desperate to correct that, and I think they very much do it here, but then they get into that same habit with Joker and Bane as they go. But I think he's 100% right that, you know, Tim Burton sort of talked about how he wanted to show a conflicted Bruce, but there's really nothing there to back it up, or it's all very subtle. This film really makes an effort to make Bruce a, like I said, a three-dimensional character. Like, he's a more sympathetic character than he's been before, and they a key part of this film that they haven't done before or since is justifying why he is batman like you see him yes. brainstorming the idea and it's so strong and i think all of that is is fantastic yeah it uh like by the time he actually is batman you think it's completely natural and everything yes. and uh it's not just this is a guy and, and that's another thing bale wanted to say like this isn't just a guy in a costume like there's batman batman is a like, that's the key some of the key quotes of this film it's it's about becoming more than a man it's about being a symbol and sort of building this persona up it's not just a rich guy playing like this is a thing he's consciously crafted and and designed yeah and i think also showing him cuz this film it starts out non-linear like you have him you know falling in the well and then you have him in the prison and then you flash back to him as like a early 20s guy who's visiting Gotham for the uh, the trial of Joe Chill, who killed his parents, uh, about whether he will be released early. And then, you know, you see him in his training, and then you see him as the more grown-up man, and you see very these different variations of Bruce, and I think it helps make him more believable, more human, more sympathetic, because you see him as, as literally a kid, you see him as an angry young man who's kind of a jackass to people, but he's so broken he can't really help it. And then you see a more grown-up version towards the end. And yeah, I, I think it's it's great. And that goes a long way. Yeah, I think the journey Bruce goes on feels very earned. It mm. feels like a worthy story to tell. It feels like um, that this was a lonely, broken child who made just made a series of choices that... I mean, or made a series of choices that basically led him to a fork in the road. Mm-hmm. And he had to continuously make the the right choice over and over and over again. Um, and I think it, it, it kind of allowed it, like you you understand who and Batman is based on like these competing ideas of what justice is and what it means to you know fight injustice. And I, I, I think it just leads to a very complex, interesting portrayal of batman himself and in a way that you never get from any other live action batman story no as as i there are people i know who don't like batman because they see it as one dimensional of just here's this angry guy who can't get over the death of his parents and he's just punching people and i i stress to them like he's 
there is a philosophy and a and a psychology and a cerebralness to this character that is is interesting and i think this is this to me is why i think this film is that hair better than dark knight is because they really delve into that in a way that doesn't happen before or since and like you get him like for instance when he's visiting uh gotham as the college kid he says how if it were up to him he would tear the mansion down brick by brick and then by the film's end when the mansion has been literally destroyed he says uh it's got to be deliberate he says how he's going to rebuild it brick for brick and I just think that, that the way they get from there to there is very earned and yeah. so well handled. Yeah, yeah. and I, like I said, I th- really think the idea of what justice is and your sen- like your idea of what the world is, um, I like how they really establish it here and then basically set it up to be challenged in yes. the next one. Yes, 100%. Um, which is why I, I don't... I mean, I will get into that more, and we'll discuss Dark Knight, but on the surface, without doing a heavy, heavily pay attention to rewatch of the Dark Knight yet, my instinct is to disagree with you with your with your comments about how the portrayal of Bruce Wayne going forward, but we'll save that for later. Okay. But uh, yeah, I, I think... There's less emphasis really, on it, I think. Perhaps. It may not be, compl- I, 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 it may not I, be I, completely I, absent, but this is this is a Bruce Wayne film. Yes, that, that's undoubtedly true. And but, then the um, second one is a, is a Batman film, and the third one is a Gotham film. There, there's a quick improvised opinion for you. I'll see if I can back that up. I'm going to go. I'm going to cautiously disagree, but not okay. in the not in the sense that I'm saying you're wrong. Just more okay. I'm, now I'm I'm excited to watch the, mo- the yes. no, those two movies again with yeah. those ideas in mind, looking yeah. for them. So um, you, you said how uh, it's conflicting ideas of justice and and you know the conflict generally and that really comes from I, I we we've been talking about this a lot leading up to this podcast i think it's fantastic that you get his father thomas wayne played by linus roach instilling this like concrete infallible moral code uh with such a good performance and you, you get it through flashback about him you know saying why do we fall bruce so we can learn to pick ourselves up and, and whatnot and then you have that juxtaposed with Liam Neeson as Rachel Gould, who is, you know, at a time when he's an orphan and he's alone traveling the world, he becomes an almost a temporary father figure to him. And he gives him uh, the teachings about being a symbol, about how, how to use fear as a weapon. And these things that become core tenets of Batman, he gets from, from Raish. And, and in many ways, Batman is is a student of of the League of Shadows, but then that difference where he won't kill and he does believe in hope for Gotham, that comes from his father. And I I love this idea that he's so heavily influenced by his father, by Raish, and then we'll talk about it in a different way later by by Rachel and later by Alfred more and more as he goes as well. And I but initially that sort of the two the the angel and the devil on his shoulder of thomas wayne and ray shagul i think is amazing and while at the same time there is like pros and cons to each of the, like it's even it's almost too simplistic like i say the angel and the devil mm-hmm. because without ra's al ghul bruce doesn't become the man he doesn't become batman yes um you know Absolutely. Like, he if, gives him all the if, tools yeah and perhaps if thomas wayne you know was a more forceful person perhaps you know gotham is not in a place where it is yeah arguably. Like, i mean they, you're, they that's, have, infer- that's that... certainly inferring a lot yeah they have but, that discussion uh, when they're on the train about his sort of philosophy on how to help the city and it's like this is a billionaire who uh you know he could arguably do more and i also like the idea that bruce has romanticized his father because he you yes. know, he was taken from him when he was a child and there is this element of everything you ever see of the Waynes is through Bruce's eyes so I think yeah. in a world where his father doesn't die and Bruce grows up and becomes a man in his own right he maybe doesn't have that like ingrained moral code that came from this whiter than white perfect man Thomas Wayne who is you know his absolute role model and it's he he probably isn't whiter than white, but just I like the idea that Bruce sees him that way, and that that's what keeps him grounded. And then at the same time, you also have 
you know, Thomas Wayne, who kind of represents, okay, let's try to work within the system to try yeah. to make slow change over time. Um, yes. Versus the League of Shadows, which is kind of just about burning the place to the ground. Um, arguably also relevant to today's politics. <laughs> okay, do. And the innate appeal of both of those tact, um, both of those ideas, those themes, those, ide- those philosophies is part of the reason why this movie is more interesting than just about every superhero story ever told on the big screen. Yeah. And you, you get Raish literally criticizing Thomas Wayne because he, he shares oh, yeah. this painful origin story and he's not like, oh, I'm sorry. He's like, well, it was your father's fault. And it's like, whoa. And he talks about yeah. how training means nothing. It's all about the will to act. And that is so Batman that, like, yes, yeah. he is this fantastically well-equipped, very well-trained person, but the the fundamental thing that makes him Batman is his sort of arrogant will that he will literally never give up and he will kill himself, like, saving people. Yeah, it's. I think what's interesting about Batman is in that same way of, like, when you read stories about, like, Michael Jordan practicing training, like, that absolute focus, like, same like a Tiger Woods, too, like, mm-hmm. that literal insane like that that line between sane and insane is not really clear with people like this and but it makes it for incredibly fascinating uh, uh storytelling he's I, I think that's the key with like bruce is like as a you know i guess an agent of change perhaps would be the most generous way to put it like he is like the michael jordan of the agents of change <laughs> like <laughs> yeah it's not that he is necessarily the strongest or whatever he is just so incredible like he will not allow himself to fail. Uh, and a lot of that comes from, as we said, at, from Thomas and Raish. And, and, and uh, uh, I think with that, we got to talk about uh, Raz al Ghul. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can tell you, you know what? There are, I guess, four major villains in uh, the Nolan trilogy. All three of them are so great in their own different ways. And uh, I, I, I think... But Raz al Ghul gets the least amount of credit by far. Mm. Oh, and Liam Neeson just nails it. Oh God, yeah. It's it's just a, a beautiful a beautiful performance, really. Um, that's both. There's a tragedy to it. There's a grace to it. There's just every line delivery. Oh, the scene in the mansion. Yeah. When so we were, good. Oh, I, I'll never forget that moment in the theater being a dumb sixteen year old just not seeing it coming whatsoever. Yeah, yeah no, I'd also no, be, I also being also being incredibly confused. <laughs> yes. Wait, who's Ra's al Ghul? What? Yeah. what? Yeah, I mean, this, um, is, this is a less notable villain, but I think they did yes. a really good thing in... Henry, Henry Ducard is a separate character who is yes. linked to Ra's al Ghul, uh, like, in the comics. So it's not that he was playing this original creation that they came up with, and they're like, oh, no, he's totally not this. Like, people might have seen that coming. But by casting him definitively as, oh, this is Ducard, and Ken Watanabe is Ra's al Ghul. Um, and because Liam Neeson has this just relentless history of playing mentors and nice people, and he's doing that again, like, they frame it as he is the nice one amongst this, you know, cabal. He's Batman's of, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah, he's, he's the nice one in this cabal of ninjas, and like, yeah, he's saying things that Bruce doesn't agree with but you're almost like ah you don't really believe that so he saves him um and you re- i didn't see it coming at all when it happened and i felt so stupid but i don't know if i would see it coming now like if this movie comes out today where i have heightened batman knowledge and i'm older and in theory wiser i don't know if i would see it coming but it's, it's so good it's played so so well he he portrays the the power of belief so well mm-hmm. in in the way it could be positive for a person and then obviously the the obvious drawbacks with it. Yes, the line like Alfred uses in Rises where it's like I see the power of belief. Um, I see the League of Shadows. And I was just like I was like I was thinking about that line. I was watching the movie today and just like there's there's something there. There's that that cult of personality that um, I think is just so interesting and Neeson just nails every moment of. Yeah, like the Raish character, like. So many villains, you, you hear it said that like, oh, he's not really like a like a black and white evil character. Yes. He's more neutral. This is that. Like, it's so like yes. the people that say that are generally frauds. Like, they the people are actually cartoon villains. Raish is, I, I mean, I want to say chaotic neutral, but chaotic is more Joker. But you know, he he's not out and out evil. He is. There is a. The, 
they are attempting to make the world better by wiping out what is objectively a city just absolutely full of crime and like almost irredeemable um yes. they, they talk about you know smiting these cities that had gotten out of hand but they're not attempting to conquer the world he has no interest in in that it's just sort of guiding things in a what they believe is a better yeah. direction yeah there's a there's a an unstated god complex to them mm-hmm. um and what's also interesting is that the Joker and Bane, while interesting and brilliantly portrayed, arguably, are really, in the end, evil. Like, pure evil. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no real... Re- I mean, there's certainly no redemption for the Joker. May- maybe with Bane slightly, but really... A little there's, bit. But there's, 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 there's a little bit of root. There's a crack. There's a cold the malice to him yeah. that there doesn't seem to be with Raish, even if he has yeah. placed himself up above humanity, as it were, which is, you know, yeah. a, a psychotic thing to do. Um, yeah, it's so good. And, but, like, uh, that, that first scene in the prison, I sort of really took that for granted, but when doing the rewatch, I rewound that and watched that because, like, every line is so key to not just yes. how he becomes Batman, but just... And their philosophy, generally, it goes on through all three films. You can see a direct parallel where... You know, Raish talks about how they want to use fear because fear is the key theme of this film. It's why he, you know, the fear of bats makes him become Batman. Uh, the Nolan, Nolan loves theme. He won't he shut does. the fuck up about theme. <laughs> um, the fear that so uh, Carmine Falcone rules the city always prevents anyone from acting. So he goes to the League of Shadows. You were just refusing to accept any of the pronunciations of names in this movie. That is how it's Carmine- it's Falcone. Carmine Falcone. It's Falcone. Falcone, Falcone and Maroni. Yeah. It's not Maroni and Falcone. Okay, but in the movie, it's Carmine Falcone. Okay, let's say Falcone then. Falcone rules the city with, uh, with fear. No one will do anything. He goes to the League of Shadows. They literally use fear as a weapon with these hallucinogenic flowers that make you see your fears. You know, he learns about using fear against people that use it against others. Um, and he talks about um, and you know you've got Scarecrow who's literally weaponized fear, but Raish's plan is to make the city tear itself apart using fear. Now you look at Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises. What are those films about? Joker is trying to make Goth. He says he wants to uh, watch these people eat each other or something along those lines. I don't remember the quote offhand, but watch them tear each other apart uh, by using chaos and sort of taking control away from them. And then Bane makes Gotham turn on itself using a social revolution. So all of this comes from Raish, and he, uh, or Raz, as you can <laughs> create this through line through. And he, of course, will appear again in Dark Knight Rises. But just, I really took for granted how huge an influence this character is on this trilogy and how he arguably sets everything up. He arguably creates Batman, and he arguably inspires the other two villains, although Joker clearly wouldn't take direct inspiration. But, you know. I, again, that's a what's what you point out, or what I guess we both unintentionally point out is that this is a movie where the hero and the villain are both three dimensional characters who are clearly set up and given the proper amount of time, yep. so that by the time we reach their final conflict, it actually means something. And the fact that even like their final conflict, uh, conflict um, you know, their fight in the train is not like the spectacular action set piece or anything like that. There's so much more meaning to everything going on there. That yeah, doesn't need to be. They're arguing, basically. They're not really fighting. Yeah. They're just again disagreeing. Like, yeah. Because I mean, I don't. They don't really. They never really fight each other in the movie with the, uh, not not the intention to kill, but more like, I don't think that either one of them is deluded enough to think they can easily beat the other. Yeah, that, that's or another. Think that, that's... Or think that their their battle will not be decided by a, a contest of one on one combat. Yeah, that's another thing with the character. Like he has, he doesn't really have any interest in fighting batman it's just they're on opposite sides of a debate so they must yeah. clash but there's no real yeah. there's never really an attempt to like go after batman as you said they're both really uh well-rounded and juxtaposed um there is a problem in this film in that well we were sitting down trying to think of it um there are really no women in this trilogy no <laughs> it's a very it's a male dominated story there's rachel Dawes. There's, there's Talia Catwoman. and there's Catwoman. And there's, yeah, that's almost literally it. There are plenty of females on screen in backgrounds and yeah. saying one line, but in terms of characters, uh, not many. However, while you know underrepresentation of women is a huge problem in cinema generally, at least where 
while we only have one woman, she does at least feel like a like a person. <laughs> like yes. She she has motives and and she does things. And while again, this person is mostly there to serve the int- the development of the protagonist. She is at the same time a person actively involved in the story, impacting the story. I, like these are low bars to get over. But, yes, <laughs> you know they get over them. Yeah, but yeah. Um, so Katie Holmes as Rachel Dawes, who is an original creation for this trilogy. Um, I think the character is good. She doesn't necessarily play it badly. It's just she kind of is the weak link flat. of the cut. Co- yeah, there's like almost it's shallow. Almost. She well, doesn't pop off because, the screen, and yeah. she, she has popped off the screen in other movies. Yeah, she's. I think, but, she's uh, good. I think Maggie I, Gyllenhaal Matt, plays her better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if there's an issue with the character, it's that she's really mostly there. Once again, it's, she's just mostly there to serve as like the con, like Bruce's conscious to drive him forward um, at various points, at varying points throughout the story, and uh, you know that's kind of inherently weak. But you know, at the same time, like what, like I said, it's like almost everything she like, you can really like, ex- everything she does in the movie is basically to push Bruce forward. Um, yeah, like she, she is sort of a moral measuring stick for him. Yeah. Where like he's out in public acting this this playboy persona he's created to a, you know avert suspicion, which I you know that doesn't really come up that much before. You see him being this way, but you don't hear him saying in previous films, you know, this is an intentional tactic to divert attention. And he sort of you know when he bumps into her in the lobby of this hotel or restaurant or whatever it is, you know you see him like so glum that she's judging him, and uh, he then is attempting to win her approval as Batman because he's 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 lost it as Bruce, um, and and yeah it it does suck that she is essentially uh, like she's a carrot on the stick for Bruce essentially, um, where his father. His father's moral code is pushing him forward, and Rache gives him that training, and Alfred will eventually become the nurturing figure. But Rachel acts as a sort of another driving force for him, where you know he's trying to win her approval in this film, and then when she tells him that she can't be with him, we'll talk about it in the next film, where he sort of misinterprets uh, their situation for better or worse. But it does, I do like that it does tie into this idea of. While he is strong of will, he is also arguably dragged in several directions by other people and does kind of lose a little bit of agency because he's sort of trying to serve these different masters. Um, a little possibly. bit. Possibly. <laughs> yes. I'm not, I'm not saying he doesn't know what's happening, but there is an almost sympathetic delusion to him. Yes. But I, I, I think that's more part of his growth as a character. and like It seems very... In, realistic based on how he reacts so extremely to everything yes that, um, that's a that's a big thing with the character he is a person of extreme he's all or nothing like, exactly like <laughs> because if you think about it, batman is really the creation of a child like yes it's like you know he has no parents and he has billions of dollars and he has a manservant and he has all this technology and without i'm not saying alfred didn't raise him right but sort of the absence of parents has allowed him to almost stay in some ways childish in in his naivety that like he can fight crime by himself um and i think that does uh lead to this this life of extremes where it's like he's not just a crime fighter he's like the most motivated best crime fighter ever yeah and uh she, you know she Katie Holmes is not terrible but i she, yeah. it's she, just there she's the more. one that and we see up. more yeah, yeah. Um, um, so I mentioned Alfred um, and Lucius, I did mention. I think the decision to give, uh, to cast so many like incredibly good, well-respected, legendary actors as the supporting cast around um, Batman, and you know Liam Neeson counts as that for the villain as well. Like, we've had Jack Nicholson as a villain, um, and I guess Danny DeVito, not on the same level, but, you know, well-known people as villains has happened before. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones, Jim Carrey, you know, Uma Thurman. Um, this is the first time that there's been a real effort to swing it the other way, where you have Gary Oldman as Jim Gordon, you have Michael Caine as Alfred, you have Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox, 
Um, just a hell of a trio of actors there playing support, and it, you know, it it works out for the best, as for the best, unsurprisingly. Yeah, and uh, you really get that sense that Kane, Freeman, and Oldman will go down as the definitive versions of each of these characters. Yeah. Uh, the, the degree to which Gary Oldman looks like Jim Gordon in Year One is uncanny. Like you'd think that. Year one was written after seeing Batman Begins, almost. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, we'll talk about it more. But like, I like even just his physical progression throughout the movies, where yeah. like the Dark Knight, he's at, he's basically at his peak physically in terms of, I'm a soldier in this war, like, and then you know he's kind of he's kind of put on some weight by the yeah. third one, etc. Well, yeah, we t- we uh, talked about this previously when talking about Pat Hingle as as Commissioner Gordon, where. Uh, that's the ba- that's the Gordon you grew up with, and and um, that I've... Michael Gale. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, but um, I'm forgetting who played Gordon in the '60s. But either way, uh, you're, um, you're used to this stuffier, sort of bumbling man, and you you mentioned yeah. on the podcast how when Gordon suddenly becomes rough and tumble, you're like, oh whoa, um, yeah, and <laughs> Gary Oldman really does give us that um, to a generation of people, and like you know, I I don't know at what stage Jim Gordon began to be treated this way um per se but like he's definitively that now um yeah yeah just really good like and as we said how like liam neeson always plays uh nice people (laughs) gary oldman frequently a villain so having him play this just white knight almost is is refreshing but he does it so well because you know shockingly people gary oldman's a good actor yeah i mean there's just a conviction to what he does that uh you need for a, a he, he doesn't oversell it like no i like the fact that because he he says how he doesn't rat out the people he knows are you know corrupt cops like he, he's not going all the way but he is still like he does have his beliefs um and it, it's just earnest yeah and uh yeah it's actually it's kind of funny though because you know for a lot of people before the mid-2000s uh like Gary Oldman will probably be always thought of as a villain, yet probably to an entire yeah. generation, if not two, it's Batman and Harry Potter. So mm-hmm. he will go down as like this hero to a whole different generation. Um, not Jean Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg. Uh, Fifth, um, no, no one. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but like he's just, and once again, this is something I, I stress all the time with ser- superhero movies: is that it's so necessary for it to feel like an ensemble. And mm-hmm. to a certain extent, a team tackling whatever the issue is, even if it's called Batman, there is there's a sense that this is a team dealing with it. And it's a group effort. Yeah, well, that's the and, funniest uh, thing about Batman. Like he's it's it's like Wolverine, really. Like he's a you know he will tell you he's a loner, but there's a ridiculous number of people on his support staff, and like you know in the comics you have this larger Batman family with Nightwing and Robin and etc. But it, like yeah, like you said, like it works so well having this this support structure of. You know, he's got Jim Gordon as like almost a partner, but yeah. from another side of of it. And then you got Alfred to, you know, be his father, be his confidant, to philosophize yeah. Batman with him, to help him design it. And then you've got Lucius Fox as as the tech support, as the science, um, but also offering, I think, a little bit of sort of fatherly advice here and there. But yeah. so good. I I, th- I think with you know, Freeman once again we've talked about representation a lot in these uh-huh. comic book movies and uh, not a ton of black people in these movies. <laughs> uh, a few actually, you know, like a few like like a there's a random D like a lawyer who pops up at one point and um, uh, Commissioner Loeb, the, the commissioner, Commissioner yeah. Loeb, yeah. Um, classic portrayal by Colin McFarlane. Yep. Um, I've written him down on the cast list and then I have no notes on him whatsoever. <laughs> I've just uh, I think he does like a good job. That's fine. It's clearly. just there's, there's nothing, nothing there. to say. There's nothing really from that. Yeah. Morgan Freeman, Freeman being it, Morgan Freeman. Such a, <laughs> yes, he's such a talented actor, especially I mean, at portraying Morgan Freeman. <laughs> and they give him a few lines that hint at like a journey, and he has like an a sort of an arc, so to speak. Uh, his uh, his his redemption. Yeah. Uh, Where well, like Rutger Hauer has downtrodden him and relegated yeah. him to this this. Lowly uh, position of yeah. uh, having access to every technical toy in the world in a yeah. basement somewhere. I don't really think this is how corporations operate, but what do no. I know? Uh, and, you know, how um, he, he says how he used to be on the board uh, with when, you know, Bruce's father, father was alive. Yeah. 
There you go. Um, and you know, he gets that right. Oh, yeah. Help him build his train. There you go. Um, you said at the beginning how you don't think of these films as dark. I think Lucius is... Every goddamn line he says is a joke, almost. Yeah. Is, is a quip, and that flies right in the face of that. These films are so dark and gritty. Like he is, you know, most of what he says is funny. A lot of what Alfred says is funny. Like, yeah. But Lucius is is, you know, you just get this sense of like he's a little bit sort of world weary. He's clever enough to know what Bruce is is vaguely doing, and he's just like, I don't care. Like, here's some cool shit. <laughs> like, and yeah. it, it works really well. Because if you do make this too serious, like it, it sort of It'd be boring. It, yeah, it eats itself almost. It's crushed under yeah. the weight of the seriousness, and that's why you have Lucius and Alfred and Jim and Rachel as well, arguably. Tom Wilkinson, in one of the most bizarre castings ever, classic yeah. British theater actor, plays Italian mob boss Carmine Falcone. Mm. Um, the Roman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, in- English actors are just better. I mean. Pfft. What can I say? No, they are. They yeah. absolutely are. Uh, it it's, is a, a, it's a small bizarre world. choice, but it is. I, I, think I like it. It fits. Like yeah. I think it, it doesn't quite fit with the rest of the tone. It's a little hammy. Mm. But but like I not like to I think it, that's it, on purpose. Like oh yeah yeah. I'm like I'm saying it doesn't distract from it. It, it just yeah. it feels always feels it's a little jarring to me yeah. every time. Well, he's like the living embodiment of like generic gangsters. Um, that, yeah. that's what he and, and Sal Maroney represent you know he doesn't do a huge amount but I do like the conversation he has with Bruce where he's like I yeah. wouldn't hesitate to shoot you right in front of yeah. these people and that's that's fear that's power you can't buy and like that, that helps scene. with that fear motif now was Gandolfini off for Falcone or for Maroney I know he was up oh, for uh, one of them I think, I think it was uh, Falcone yeah. I, th- I think I remember reading that I'm trying to. Th- I'll look it up. But uh, it would have been. I mean, I, it's so hard to picture Gandolfini playing any other mobster. It almost feel like he'd be cheating. <laughs> but uh, that would have been interesting. But I think you know, Fal- Wilkinson, good actor. Small part. Can't complain about. Does well enough. Um, you got Killian Murphy as the Scarecrow. Uh, he auditioned for Bruce Wayne. Didn't get it. But along with every other white yes. person. Yeah, that's true. Or white male, I should say. Uh, but Christopher Nolan uh, is physically enchanted by him, which is why he keeps popping up in all his things. Uh, so he gave him Scarecrow, and he uh, he pushed for him to not wear the mask that often because he likes his eyes. Yeah, it was another thing where I was just like, okay, Scarecrow's in it, and like he's just playing like Jonathan Crane the whole time. As a kid, this was so crushing. Like, <laughs> give me villains. Um, but yes. yeah, luckily, I've grown up. Yeah. Uh, it's you can't you in in this film that's about fear you can't have anyone else he's he literally uses fear oh, yeah, as yeah, a yeah. weapon. Um, well, I, what I meant is just that I'm like as a kid I'm so oh yeah no no like, I, when I, I still thought Batman Forever was great uh, <laughs> you know like where's my two villains I get yeah. two villains every time <laughs> he's the closest uh, thing you get to the over the top villain and he actually yeah. isn't that over the top um, no not at all but he's a sort of good gateway villain because. You know, he has the fear toxin, but physically he's got nothing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, like, that's every Scarecrow story. Like, he, he gasses Batman, Batman is temporarily affected by it, and then once he gets his hands on him, it's game over. And that happens here, where Rachel tases him in the face. Um, he's given a decent performance, it's just... Oh, I think he's great. Yeah. I really... Yeah, it's good. Um, and we will see it's a him. side It's a side villain, but it's, yes. a, it's a good one. We'll see him come back. Uh, and he is, as I said, like a gateway to your Joker-esque characters, where he's almost he's almost pretending to be someone like Joker, when really you get the sense, you know, yeah. you get, he, he's a he's, he's a poor man's Joker. Yeah, he's like going around, he's living his normal life, he likes television, he likes his foods, yeah. whatever. And then he plays this character of Scarecrow. You know, like he, he's no. playing at being the Joker. And that doesn't yeah. work because you have Batman who isn't wearing hockey pads. Um, yes, but not. Sh- yes. Um, I, I, I guess to push us back to one last character we sh- or actor we should discuss, and it also gets back to the issue of representation. Uh, Ken Watanabe. Hmm. Uh, got great his actor. A, got Come his on. ass cast in Inception from this. Yes, uh, you feel like that was like his payment for hmm. the indignity here. Uh, he's not act like. He's announced as playing Ra's al Ghul, like, at the time. He's simply a decoy, 
feels kind of cheap, feels a little exploitive a little bit, just like, because, again, man, I mean, we're also dealing with the whole uh, lost white soul goes off to mystical Asia <laughs> to find himself yes. thing. Like, yes. that's all going on here. Yeah. And then, like, the Asian villain is literally, he's not even actually the villain. He's just a wannabe for the, the other white lost soul who found his way to mystical Asia and became yes. the villain. That's true. Uh, um, a little shitty. <laughs> yeah. It's but, a little shitty. But casting someone who is notable like that, I yeah, think yeah. It, I, I mean, think it, I think it helps sell the the misdirect with Liam Neeson. Like oh, it, it does. Like and if it was the guy that at the party who he thinks yeah. is Ken Watanabe, um, the whole way, then it would probably be easier to guess the twist. But by having someone quote unquote real as as Raish, I guess it would help throw people off the scent. Now I know we're not going to not talk about how Joffrey is in. Joffrey's film. in it. Yeah, I was actually just thinking about that. Yeah, I mean that's a funny scene. Like yeah. a lot of good memes. Yeah, Some I mean, solid meme work yeah, by I the mean, internet. You've got this frequent argument that Batman should just kill the Joker or the villains and, and save the future victims. Case in point right here. He kills Joffrey Baratheon. Westeros is better for it. Yes. I guess we didn't actually talk about Michael Caine in depth, but he's he's very good. He's great. He's, <laughs> he's, he's Alfred. There, I don't think any other Alfred will yeah. probably come close. Nope. Um, and like, what more would you want? What more would as you good want as Alfred? Jeremy Irons is objectively as an actor, it's like, bro, you can't follow Michael Caine's Alfred. Yeah, no one was going to. Like, I don't. Yeah. I like. Um, I like that he is like poking holes and sort of troubleshooting uh, Batman almost. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think just how it's just interesting watching them build Batman. Yeah, it's like so. Like when he's finally is Batman, it feels all the once again all the more earned. Like there's they earn so much in this movie. Yeah. Um, like, everyone loves a good uh, sort of it, it's it's sort of an offshoot of a training montage but you know like where you watch Tony Stark fucking around building the Iron Man armor people like those kinds of scenes and I think this is a good one of those I mean I would say it's the best one yes. because it, it yeah. feels like how do we manage to build this because there's we, we can't build all the parts ourselves we have like we have to order 10,000 of them just to avoid suspicion like and like how they're going to order each part from a different company, like I don't know, like I just think it's clever, it's interesting, it's it a, is, it's a twist. It shows, um, it shows, kind of montage. yeah, it shows a sort of realism where all yeah. those previous films, you're like, how would he have done any of this? How did he invent the <laughs> Skype watch in 1995? <laughs> um, how does no one else have it? Uh, he, uh, he's never heard of a Caspatro, but he's he's got a Skype watch. Yeah. But like compared to like Tony Stark, you know, pressing a bunch of CGI buttons in the air. Yeah, that's true. Like it just it doesn't even compare. That seems a lot of fun, but yeah, this is be, like, like it's, by being so sort of realistic and believable, it, it, it makes for a better scene. And also, Tony Stark kind of does that silently, and we sort of infer things. I like that they talk out loud about why they're doing it, and it's why you have yeah. Alfred. <laughs> yeah. Like, all that stuff's great. And, of course, he I, will act his ass off as it goes on, and we'll, we'll get to that. But um, uh, I, I, I like him sort of dressing him down when he comes home and is kind of a dick. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so good. Like, he's he obviously is subservient to him because he's his indentured butler, but he also isn't afraid to stand up to him, and I, I like that. Like Michael Go I mean, gave like, a sarcastic paid. quip here and there. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Uh, Michael Go did make a little, you know, muttered under his breath type thing, but really he just bends over backwards. And I like that this version of Alfred is willing to say, hey, bro, cool it. It's all so good. Yeah. I, I like the way Gotham looks and feels oh, yeah. in this film. Feels um, like a city. Yeah, and like it doesn't feel like some weird soundstage, <laughs> timber and diarrhea, like wet dream combination. Uh, yes, yes, that. And I actually um, I like how it looks it, compared to the next two films as well. Where in the Dark Knight, it almost just it's like, well, this is Chicago, um, just generic large city. I like that this has the slums and you know the monorail makes it look different. Like it, it, it feels. This is the I think this is the best Gotham. You know, it doesn't. It's evocative of New York and Chicago and whatever, but it does feel like a fictional city they made up as opposed to just, this is any old city. And I also like uh, that they... You know, as that, a noted expert on Chicago, it's, mm. you know, it's good that you, you let them know. Dark Knight was too Chicago. It was not, it was, this was just, just the right amount of Chicago. It just looks like Chicago. I don't know what Chicago looks like. I do. 
And the third one looks like uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah, the third one's... I, I do like... No one's very good with the bullshit. It's like, clearly they had a tax credit, so they went and filmed in Pittsburgh. It's like, well, I wanted to, like, capture many different cities. Like, you know, there's so many different parts of Gotham. It's like, no, no. You just save a ton of money by filming in Pittsburgh. Don't lie. Yeah. But, all, all right. right. Even, I mean, like, I, I think that even is a good reason. But, like, at least, like, admit it was for the money. Okay, even even if I'm not an expert on what Chicago looks like, I do think it looks like just any old big city. Whereas I think in this film, it look, you know, it's like they've created something. Like there's a, there's a there's a blend of actual city Perhaps. and sets that they've made and like the slums like that doesn't yeah. look like anything yeah and, I, and like, I think most importantly Gotham is like a character like yes you, like it's a living breathing organism well, they're, fight, that is they're clearly... fighting for the soul of Gotham throughout yeah. these films um, yeah and uh... and they don't just tell you it's corrupt they show you like you see. Um, Carmen Falcone, like Falcone, sorry, just openly getting away with what he wants, and you see these judges and cops and whatnot in this sleazy bar, and you see how Jim Gordon is ineffective, and you see Arnold Fleiss, um, Flass, sorry, Arnold Fleiss, yeah. being a dick. Mark Boone Jr. also does a very nice job as Flass. Yeah, it's fine. And I think that's a. I think that character was a key part uh, for the audience understanding how far where Gotham is now. Yeah. Uh, you kind of see, like, he kind of represents how it's not all this, like, mass, like, conspiracy. It's just, like, these are the people that thrive in mm. the state that Gotham's in now. Yeah, he's just he's just a scummy dude. He's not necessarily, yeah. like, into a conspiracy. He's just like, well, they pay me, and I'm kind of shitty, so I'll do it. Yeah, I, I think they do the best job of conveying how... Like, they, they talk about how Gotham is the worst, and you get a lot of... I think... In a lot of Batman projects, you kind of just get... It's like, he's Batman, and this is just where he happens to live. But I think they make a concerted effort to be, like... Specifically, Gotham needs specifically Batman. He attempts to march right up to Carmine and be like, I'm not scared of you. But then he feel You know, he is left powerless and, and shown that other people are powerless. So he has to go out and become Batman and, and change the way that city thinks about things. And uh, we'll see that as we go. Which gets us to, uh, I, I think, like, the, the thing with Batman, once again, is that they're crafting this story where you're basically approving of fascism. <laughs> like, um, we are so lost, we must unofficially elect this person to lead us back into the light. I think they are aware of that. I think that you see in the, in the Dark Knight how, like, the potential pitfalls of that and yes. I think they address that very well with the telecommunications like component. Yeah, and with and, then, and with Harvey and like how Bruce recognizes that Harvey is more capable of facilitating good than he is. Yeah, and then also I really like the idea that the dent crime bill or whatever the fuck it was called hmm. um, was this huge overreach in power in criminal justice reform, in that you didn't really you don't really recognize what you do to a city when you imprison everyone so nonchalantly. <laughs> um, and we've seen that in American cities when that happens and it's not good for anyone. Yeah. And it doesn't address the structural issues and institutional issues that actually led to all that crime being committed. It instead scapegoats it on uh, the people who are committing it. And, you know, that kind of allows everyone to think like, Oh, the issue solved. It's a, interesting take it's uh there's there's a lot to discuss there will be a lot to discuss yeah and they and they do lightly touch on it with race saying how they tried to cripple the city with economics and his father you know discussing how the city is is complex and difficult to fix and Mm. so i that actually brings up a good point what raz al ghul is saying is that gotham at one point was so corrupt that they tried to cripple it economically. Mm-hmm. But people like Thomas Wayne kind of served as a barrier to mm-hmm. that. With foundations it, and philanthropy and whatnot. Yeah. Well, I mean, when Thomas Wayne is killed, it's we are led to believe, if not outright told, that Gotham is in a pretty bad state at that moment. Mm-hmm. So I mean, like I wonder, like how much of the League of Shadows is like a self fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> like you know like what i'm saying it's like when you look at the timeline of it, it's like 
like if it's real if it's so bad then that Thomas Wayne being murdered was kind of like a galvanizing point for the city for a bit to not yeah. the, be that, itself alive. Yeah, that theme is is heavily touched on throughout the history where it's like once they lost the Waynes, they all just completely gave up hope. But, but no, but that's the op- it's, it's not in the movie they say it's it was kind of a galvanizing point where it's like, okay, we need to fix this. Rachel does after 20 years, let's say, 15 years after Thomas Wayne dies. You care about justice? Look beyond your own pain, Bruce. The city is rotting. People talk about the Depression as if it's history, and it's not. Things are worse than ever down here. So the idea is that, like, we escaped the Depression, we escaped all this, and the idea was, I'll find the other quote about how Thomas Wayne's death galvanized the city to a certain extent. But like, the idea is that the perception is, is that the city got better there. Well, afterwards. is it not more that, like, they just sort of relegated the, the slums were sort of created... And the wealthy Raz, people... Raz al Ghul. Their deaths galvanized the city into saving itself, and Gotham has limped on ever since. Weird. You, I see no evidence of that in the actual... Like, the the way... Like, that, to me, strikes me as an enormous plot hole. <laughs> in that, yeah, they're well, saying that, that, but, like, the the way the city appears is it is it has gone into decline, because without people like Thomas Wayne, people just have become apathetic and allowed organized crime to happen. Where people are getting murdered and mugged every day. Well, I mean, there and they was just organized... go, yeah, well, that's cool. Well, there was organized crime before their death too. But it's more rampant since. Anyway, that doesn't even really. We've got really even not only sidetracked yeah, gonna... the whole discussion. My original question, which is, their whole like, I think there is a huge issue with their. I mean, obviously, there are huge issues with their philosophy and yeah, mindset. Think... But I'm, okay, there's huge issues with the League of Shadows mindset in general, obviously, given their extreme methods, but. Like I was like, it, it just seems like such a self fulfilling prophecy. It's like, okay, we've determined that this city is is too corrupt, so we're going to make it more corrupt. Well, like, I, think, I think their argument would be they're accelerating what they have observed is one hundred percent going to happen anyway. So they're just sort of speeding things along. Would be their stunt. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, it just seems I I feel like I mean, this, I'm like I'm arguing with a fictional character. Like, <laughs> have you considered other methods? Yes. <laughs> well, you could argue that them playing judge during executioner has is is bad, and similarly, the person they trained, Bruce Wayne, Batman, is judge jury and executioner, and we see that that doesn't work out as well as he'd like. Yes, so you well, can I argue he's ha- accidentally learned that from them as well. Yeah, well, I think what you can say is he's he's basically acting as like a cop assistant in the first one, and the big payoff in the Dark Knight is that he's actually allows them to act as judge and jury and that kind of set up the city for its quote-unquote revolution which in the face of occupy wall street was hugely an issue at the time and really condescending although seems more appropriate now yes so that that's that's batman begins i guess um yeah overall very good we've we've said a lot of the good stuff there is some weaker stuff such as I, I think the final act is a little bit weaker than the first two. I don't really like Jim Gordon driving the Batmobile around and say, <laughs> saying things like, I've got to get me one of those. Uh, those are weaker moments. Overall, but overall, yeah. overall, very, very good. I, I think probably the middle act is my favorite. I think the first yeah. one feel is a little rushed at times. That scene in the cell where Ducard finds him, like... It, like they just dive right into it, <laughs> like so yeah. much exposition. Well, that's right that's there. what I'm saying. Why I I rewatched it because I was trying to. It's just uh, they just an onslaught of yeah. in, important <laughs> dialogue. Yes, and I had, um, to, I had to keep going back and think. Okay, yeah, yeah, good. It, it felt a little. Well, they're trying to cram a lot in. Yeah, they I mean, like I'm well, not like actually complaining. It's more just like if I'm yeah. picking what are the best acts in the movie, I'd have to, the second one feels the most organic. Yeah. And but, uh, I, you know, that's that picking, really. I would also rather, I would also prefer that the many films that say they're inspired by this did actually follow, follow this br- blueprint and moved a little bit more briskly at the beginning, even if it does feel rushed, because I hate this ongoing trope of plodding origin stories where you go an hour before anything happens. And, like, sure, he doesn't wear this Batman costume until about an hour into the film, but they earn it more. <laughs> um yeah, it's. Uh, I think. I think when you're telling that kind of story, the margin of error is just very small, and very few movies are capable of pulling it off. This one just kind of happens to. Yes. So, uh, as we said, this film 
is quietly very successful. It made three hundred and seventy four million dollars on a budget of one hundred and fifty plus a hundred of marketing. So you know a slimmer amount of profit than that sounds like, but you can tell that this film was very expensive to make. All these huge sets and like the Bat Cave is a real cave and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it's a quiet success. People are there is word of mouth going around. Oh hey, Batman's really good. It's not campy this time, and that will swell. And we will get incredible anticipation for what we will be talking about on the next episode of The Tape Crusaders, which is The Dark Knight, everybody's favourite Batman film, the, the sort of holy grail of Batman films in terms of public perception. Influenced countless movies like the upcoming Power Rangers. Yep. Star Trek, <laughs> Spider-Man, Terminator, so many. Wow. It's still rated number four on IMDb by viewer by fans. I did not know that. Get the hell out of here. Eh? We are going to get the hell out of here, actually, because we've been talking for over an hour about this film, and our, <laughs> the summary is this film is amazing. Uh, wonderful cast, very well written, very well directed. It will then lead to the sequel, which is one of the biggest sort of events in cinematic history, at least modern cinematic history. And I'm very excited to talk about The Dark Knight, and we will be doing that next time. In the meantime... Do us the favor of promoting this to everyone. Um, the real into the real world dot com, uh, soundcloud dot com slash Mike and Matt. Uh, I think the same with YouTube. Uh, find us, share it, like it. Interstellar is thirty two. That is not accurate. I'm sorry, I've gotten lost in the IMDb top. That's fine. That. You do these things. So this that's been Mike. He's lost in the <laughs> IMDb page. I'm Matt Ward, too sure, faithful professional host, and I will see you next time. The pianist forty two. We'll be talking about the Dark Knight, Two Crusaders, Michael Matt.